It is good to see everybody tonight. Why don't we stand together and we're going to jump right into song, just giving praise and thanks to our God, to our Jesus for what he's done tonight.
You may be seated. We always morning.
Well, good evening. The reason we can laugh on Good Friday is because of what Christ has done for us, right? If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Matthew chapter 26. I'm about to preach a half-hour sermon in 10 minutes, so I hope you're ready. Matthew chapter 26, those that have heard me probably, they're all thinking, oh, he's going to go 30 minutes. Uh, Matthew chapter 26. Today is the day that we remember Jesus on the cross, what his death, his crucifixion provided for us. I want to step back just a moment in time. Matthew chapter 26, I'm going to begin reading in verse 36. 26, 36. Then Jesus went to his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground, and he prayed, my father, if it is possible, May this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come. And the Son of Man delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. I want to reflect in the next few moments with you on the idea of surrender. Surrender. This is what Jesus did for you and for me. He surrendered. He gave up. So much. Philippians chapter 2, Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, going to the cross, surrendering his life. Look specifically at verse 39. After already praying, he went a little bit further and he fell with his face to the ground. And he continued to pray. Later we find out that this prayer actually lasted approximately an hour. The second time he turned and prayed. We cannot possibly imagine the grief and the sorrow that Jesus was facing. Jesus said, my father, surrender is directly tied to the father. Jesus said, my father. If it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. You know, whenever we look at the the humanity of Christ, we say that Christ was fully God and fully man. When we consider the, the humanity of Christ, we think of the death of Lazarus when Jesus wept, right? Showing us the emotion that Jesus had as a man. I have to say, in this moment, I think this is the ultimate, example of Jesus showing us that he is a man. He is grieved for what is about to happen. He asks, my father, please let this go. Let this pass. In a different gospel, we're told that he was perspiring as if they were drops of blood falling off of him. His sorrow was so deep, it was almost to the point of death. 
before he was even arrested. And yet we have these words. He said, yet not as I will, but as you will. The Lord Jesus, he surrendered. Think for a moment, just reflect with me, just for a moment. What did Jesus surrender? Well, the first answer is certainly Jesus surrendered his life, right? Jesus gave up of the Father. It was not Jesus' will in that moment as a man. He did not want to surrender, but he did. He followed through and he yielded to the will of the Father. You see, Jesus, he gave up his life. He gave up his future. He gave up his friends, his comfort. He gave up his family. He gave up, we already saw that from Philippians chapter 2. He gave up his own will, gave up his own agenda. He surrendered to the will of the Father. We see that multiple times that Jesus says, at different times he prayed the same, Lord Jesus, let this pass, but if not, your will, not mine. And he said it again, Lord, Lord, Father, please let this pass. But your will, not mine. And a third time, Father, please let this pass. But not your will, uh, not my will, but yours. At one point, we see that it says that my father, it says in verse 42, my father, if it's not possible for this cup to be taken away, Unless I drink it, may your will be done. That cup reference speaks of the wrath coming from God. When Jesus said, not my will but yours, Father, he recognized that he was about to take on the sin of the world upon his shoulders. He surrendered to that. He was about to experience his father turning away from him. He surrendered to that. This is what Jesus did for you. This is what Jesus did for me. I've been thinking about this idea of surrender. All week I've been processing and reflecting. It is the greatest example of humility that I can imagine, that I can think of. As Jesus surrenders to the Father... So must we. Ultimately in salvation, at the moment of salvation, we must yield and submit and surrender to his lordship. This is what Jesus offers to us. He says, come. Surrender. That's the the absolute appropriate response is looking at the who surrendered to the Father So we surrender to God. The appropriate response is for us to surrender because Jesus surrendered to the Father. Now what are we, as we reflect upon, what does it mean for us to surrender? Well, the song, I Surrender All, right? Right? My friends, it's so easy to say that. It's a whole different thing to do. Let's put flesh on that just for a moment, and then I'm going to finish. What does it mean for us to surrender? This is what God calls us to. If you have a moment, turn over with me to Philippians chapter 2, a passage that you very well may be familiar with. I've already referenced this. The passage that says that Jesus considered equality, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But just before, when we're instructed, this is what it says. Chapter 2, verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain. See, this is surrender. 
It says, not looking to your own of you interests of others. This is the appropriate response. We are to surrender. We surrender our own glory. We surrender our own pride. We surrender our own will. We surrender our own status and the seeking of glory ourselves. We surrender our idols rather following after Jesus. As believers in Christ who have been saved by the one who surrendered his life, we're called to love others, to surrender in relationship with others. When you have a disagreement with somebody here on this earth, the Lord calls us, as it just said in Philippians chapter 2, to honor others above yourselves. Romans chapter 12 verse 10 says to seek to outdo others in showing honor. See, that's, that's what surrender looks like. When we think we're right, we give up that. We enter into our conversations with our fellow, pe- fellow people wanting to listen to them and to honor them and to lift them up. This is who we are to be because of what Christ has done for us. Because Jesus surrendered, so do we. We surrender our stuff. He calls us to that. We surrender our lives. Paul said in Acts 20, 24, however I consider my life worth nothing. You see, that's surrender. That's the same surrender that each of us to because of what Christ has done for us. I consider my life worth nothing if only I might finish the race, complete the task, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. I give up everything. I surrender everything in order to follow after my Lord and Savior and to see other people come to him. And ultimately, and I close with this, we surrender our sin, our guilt, and our shame. In Christ, as we come this evening, if you're carrying sin and shame and guilt, you get to come and lay that at the foot of the cross and walk out without it. Because that that is what Christ provides for us. Here's the greatest thing. As we surrender, there is amazing joy Think of what was accomplished on the cross. You know, salvation for all mankind. Later in Philippians chapter 2, it says that Jesus went to the cross for the joy set before him. As we surrender, joy enters in. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I can't imagine the amount of grief that you are carrying. And yet you... You surrendered all, Lord. I think of the moment in a different garden. Years before Adam and Eve, they said, your will but mine. But Jesus, in that moment, in this garden, you surrendered. Not my will, but yours. Lord, help us to follow suit. As you've given us in Philippians chapter 2, help us to humble ourselves and surrender to you and to surrender to our fellow man that is around us. Help us to love. Help us to follow in your shoes, Lord. Help us to follow your example. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing a song together.
too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go. You may be seated.
Jesus set me free. And look at the wounds that give me life, grace flowing from his side, no greater sacrifice for what he has done, what he's done, all the glory and the honor to the Son, my sins are forgiven, my future is heaven, I praise God for what he's done. For the freedom he has won Even death is dead and done His life has overcome Speak, say the name above all names Over every broken place He's risen from the grave What he's done My future is heaven. I praise God for what He's done. Now, on a throne of majesty, the Father's will complete. He reigns in victory. Good evening. On behalf of Trinity, we want to thank you for giving up your assigned seats to us. <laughs> and uh, sorry for all of you who have to sit on the other side of the service. Uh, we do thank you for opening up your church that we might be able to come and worship together with you. Uh, it is an absolute blessing uh, to be here, and we want to thank you. One of the things that, oh, you can turn your Bibles to Hebrews 11. One of the things that we have been talking about at Trinity is why we love God. So I want to start off by asking you that question. What is it and why is it that you love, serve, or surrender God? Jesus, after the feeding of the 5,000, turns to, to the people after he gets on the other side of the lake and he's walked on water and done all of that. He gets there and there's a large crowd that shows up. And he says to him, listen, you follow me because I fed you. He wanted them to follow him because they knew him. And so what we want to do this morning, or this, this morning, <laughs> you're not the only one, Pete. <laughs> what we want to do is we want to look at this for a minute, and I want you to see through all of this that we might see God more clearly. There's two sides to the cross. There is the ugliness of the cross. 
And we concentrate on that a lot. We concentrate on the crown of thorns. We concentrate on the disfigured face, the, the bones showing through, the, the body hanging on the cross. And as we stare at that and we look at that, we see a horrendous picture of what our sin deserves and what our sin does to our relationship with God. There's a beauty that's hanging on that cross. And it's my goal that we, we get to see a bit of that beauty today. So in Hebrews 1, it says this. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the exact radiance of God's glory and his exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by the power of his word. Jesus is the perfect representation of God. As we were supposed to be image bearers of God, we have become poor images of who he is. And what we see is we see Jesus especially hanging on the cross as the perfect representation of who God is and his character. So as I ask you, why do you love him? I use the example, I love watching my wife with little kids. It's just the most beautiful thing. If you ask me, why do you love your wife? I would say that's the picture I have in my mind. She is so gentle. She is so genuine. She is so kind when she is with them. There's just this beauty attached to that. If I were to say, oh, I love her because, you know, she's a great cook, because of all these things, then I only love her before, because of how she performs. We don't love God because of how he performs. We love him because of who he is. What he has done for us, we are grateful for, and we will never put that aside. But we love God because of who he is and his character, and it's time for us to be able to see his character clearly. And we will never see his character so clearly than Jesus hanging on the cross. So turn again over to Luke chapter 23, verse 32. Two other men. And while I'm reading this, I want you to look at the character of God. Try to see past the blood and the, the gore and the ugliness of the cross. That is important because we need to see our sin. We don't want to downplay our sin and the ugliness of it. But we do need to see through and to see him. So as I read, look for the character of God in this. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself, if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. So we stop there for a minute. We see him start off this part by saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then it makes a list of all of the people that are mocking him. And all of the people that he is asking forgiveness for. How patient is Jesus hanging on that cross? Man, when I stub my toe and one of the kids does something annoying, it's like, ah, just, I just bark at him, I'll yell at you. How patient is he? Long suffering. How kind are the words that come out of him, even in full pain? How gentle. What else do you see? Look through the fruits of the Spirit. You'll see them all right here on the cross. 
his kindness, his gentleness, faithfulness. Yeah, faithfulness. To me, that's the one that stands out the most. He is faithful. This is the Jesus. This is our God. This is who he is, and this is his character. Even when things are not going well, even when he is full of pain, even when he is hurting and has a crown of thorns on his head, he is gasping for breath. His kindness shines forth. It shines through all of this muck and mire. And then what's his response? But the other criminal rebuked him. Do do you fear God, he said? Since you are under the same sentence, you are punished justly. For we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, Truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. It was about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he said this, he breathed his last. Self-control. Here's Jesus hanging on the cross, full of love, enduring it because of the joy set forth before him. Peace during the most unpeaceful time. Do you hear the words that he shares? Do you hear how he talks to one another? He looks down and he sees John and he says, John, here's Mary. Mary, this is your son. John, this is your mother. He even makes sure that Mary is taken care of. To do that, he would have to press up on the nails that are in his feet and pull up to on the nails that are in his hands to be able to speak kindness. Goodness flowed out of him. So when we look at the cross, I want to look at the cross, and yes, I see my sin, and I'm not going to take my sin for granted. I'm not going to take for granted the salvation that he paid for us. But this Good Friday, I can call it really good because I can see the character of my God in Jesus, who is the perfect representation of him. And so as we come together to have communion and to worship We can worship a God who we know is kind, and his kindness leads to our repentance. We can come to him who is good, who is faithful, who is gentle, who is just. What an amazing God we serve. Is that your God today? Did you come here because you wanted to find out more about you and, and okay, I, I want to feel guilty for a little bit about my sin. Well, yes, we should. But that's not what he wants. Did you hear when I read in Hebrews, it says God spoke to the prophets in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, he speaks to us through his son. God is not silent. He is speaking and he wants to reveal himself to us. He wants to be known. And him hanging on the cross is our opportunity to see him and to know him even more clearly. So as we go through this, and as we spend time together, as you reread this when you go home, I challenge you to go to the end of every gospel and read the story of Jesus being crucified on the cross and read it a bit different. Don't read it like you are are trying to be squirmish about all that he went through. That will automatically happen. But read it and look for him. Look for him that you might know him. And that you might know him and love him. And we will draw close because that's what the cross does. The beauty of the cross pulls us in. Why do you love God? It's time for us to start seeking out who he really is and not just what he gives. Because I don't want just his gifts. I want him. He is my treasure, and he is my reward. Not the good things he gives me. He's going to give them to me. That's because he's a good father. But the closer I know him, man, it's good to be near God.
Let's pray. Father, you are an amazing God. And forgive us when we don't see you and we constantly only see ourselves. When we look at the cross way too often, all we see is our sin, but we are grateful for that. But Father, may we see the beauty of who you are, your infinite beauty, your endless beauty. What an amazing God you are. You are so gentle. You are so patient. Father, we want to know more of you. Reveal yourself to us. We thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So we come to the Lord's table. It was that Passion Week, that just before the cross, that Jesus sits down with his disciples. And he leaves us this reminder. He actually takes an old picture that they were very familiar with, the Passover, and infuses this wonderful new picture of who he is. And I was thinking about what Jeff and uh, Rob were talking about, that when he takes that bread, he, he, he breaks it and he says, this is my body. Rob talked about surrender. That this is also a, a picture of so many things, but certainly right before he goes to the cross, it's about a surrender. It's, it's my body that's going to be put on that cross. It's my blood that's going to be shed. And it's a reminder of the Passover that it, the blood covered over our sin and our shame and our stuff, as Jeff was reminding us so beautifully about that our sins are forgiven in Christ. And so he says, I, he takes this cup of the new covenant and he tells us that his blood is shed so that our sins could be forgiven. I forgot to call our guys up, but you're going to bring the trays up here if you would. You can do that now. But what a precious picture for us. We're going to celebrate the table of the Lord together. Um, I think we did it this way last year. We're going to put the elements up here, and you're, we're going to, Barb's going to start a song in a few minutes. And um, just as you're ready, come up and get both the bread and the cup and um, take them back to your seat, and we'll partake together. We have the elements here, and we also have the um, sealed cups. If you're more comfortable with that, you can grab that as well. Um, but just the, the table is such a beautiful picture of who we are in Christ. And you know what? It, I love to do this, and we just celebrated Sunday. You guys might, as, might have as well. Um, but it's so good to do this together because it's just a reminder. That it's about the body of Christ. It's not about beacon, trinity. It's about those who follow him. You know, those labels in heaven aren't going to mean a whole lot. <laughs> you know, beacon or trinity. You know, I might try to get in under, under trinity. Maybe I'll... But you know, it's just who are he, the only question is, are you mine? Do you belong to me? Are you trusting in the blood of Christ that forgives our sin and makes us whole? And so it's precious to celebrate together the Lord's Supper because we're one in Christ. Um, like I said, it's not about our denominational distinctives. You know what? At the end of the day, every every denomination, some of us are wrong on some things. We just don't know which ones. <laughs> but not about this issue. The Bible is so clear, so crystal clear about where salvation comes from. The salvation is found in no other name save the name of Jesus. And so that's, that's the core of what we're celebrating here together as churches, that we trust in the wonderful mighty, holy name of Jesus Christ. And it's his table that we come to. And so the reminder that tonight is, is if you're trusting in Jesus, you're welcome to this table. And if you're here and you're not trusting in him and you don't plan to, I want to tell you this table is not for you. Maybe uh, by saying, by not coming up, he, does, he says, I don't want you to give me tokens. I want your heart. So if, if you don't know him and 
Tonight could be the night you put your trust in him. You just call out in a simple prayer, Lord, forgive me my sin and make me whole, and I trust in Jesus Christ and his finished work, and you will be his. But if you're not in that place, the table's not for you, and I encourage you not to come up and get these elements. But if you know him, and you're trusting in him, this is a precious reminder of our faith in Christ. It's a reaffirmation of our faith in Christ. It's so many things. The table is so beautiful and so many faceted and, and it's good just to be reminded about his sacrifice on our behalf. The simple verse that for God so loved the world that he gave his son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I'm going to pray and then Barb's going to start some music and then as you're ready, come up and get the elements and just return to your seat and we'll all partake uh, together. So let's pray. Father, it's good to be here tonight to just be reminded about your cross, to be reminded about the hope of the world that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That those of us who know you, Lord, we know the best news on the planet that there's a savior, there's a rescue, there's a redeemer. There's one who surrendered his life for us and you call us to surrender to you. And really every time we come to the table, we're saying, Lord, you're my Lord, you're my savior, I do surrender. I continually to surrender to you, Lord. And Father, it's also, the table's a good time just to look at our own hearts and see if there's some way in us that's, displeasing to you and lay it at your feet because that kind of confession is always good for Christians so Lord use this time for good in each one of our hearts and refresh us as only you can Lord and we thank you for the time to be together tonight in your precious name we pray amen
My sins are forgiven, my future is heaven. It's a great song we heard before. That's the reminder that we're, our sins are forgiven in Christ, and so we do this in remembrance of him. And as he took that cup in the same manner, he, we're reminded that our blood, his blood covers over our sin. He remembers them no more. What a beautiful picture that is. And so I also remind us, as Rob did earlier, this is a, moment, this is a continual surrender for us. We surrender to his lordship, his kingship in our life, his way in our lives, which is the way, the truth, and the life. And so we do this in remembrance of him. We're going to stand and sing again, and then, Nate, would you close us in prayer?
Father God, we thank you so much for the power of the blood, for the character of our Jesus, that he was willing to surrender it all, to love us, knowing who we are, to go to that cross. We thank you for that gift. Lord, may we, as we leave here, remember who our Jesus is, that he is kind and he is patient that he is faithful and true. Let us leave here loving our Jesus for what he's done and for who he is. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.